All right, welcome everyone to uh, Literacy Council of Montgomery County, Maryland's uh, virtual brown bag session. Today is Tuesday, uh, Friday, February 10th, 2023. And uh, today's content, we're gonna talk about pronunciation priorities. But before we get into that, um, a couple of notes on how the session will run today. You should have access to both the chat and a Q&A in our Zoom webinar this afternoon. So we're going to save some time at the end for questions. Feel free to drop your questions in there at any time. They will save um, and we'll read through them at the end, kind of talk through them. And, and you know, so think of questions as they pop into your head, submit them to us and we'll get to them at the end. Um, all right, so let's, I'm, I'm a little excited today for our presenter. Uh, she used to be my boss in my former position at um, at Howard Community College, and I'm really excited to have her here. She's uh, one of the most qualified ESL teachers that I've ever met and well more than qualified in the realm of pronunciation. So let me not introduce her and I'll, I'll read the introduction that I have here because it does a better job of that. So our speaker today is Dr. Tamara Jones. Dr. Tamara Jones is an instructor for the English Language Center at Howard Community College and the MATSL program at Notre Dame of Maryland University. In both of these roles, she pulls from more than 25 years of experience as English as an additional language instructor um, in Russia, Korea, England, Belgium, and the USA. Tamara holds a PhD in education from the University of Sheffield in the UK and has been a regular presenter at local, national, and international conferences, including Maryland TESOL, WA TESOL, uh, TESOL International, and IATAFL. She's the author of Q Skills for Success, Listening and Speaking for 50 Ways to Teach Them Vocabulary, 50 Ways to Teach Them Pronunciation, and Phonetics in Language Teaching. And she's an editor of Pronunciation in the Classroom, The Overlooked is Central, and Listening in the Classroom, Teaching Students How to Listen. I'm very happy to introduce Tamara Jones. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, coming out this afternoon. Um, and we'll jump right in. So I think the first question that um, we need to address in this session is which pronunciation is the correct pronunciation? Whose pronunciation are we talking about when we talk about pronunciation priorities? And we need to remember, of course, that while there are 360 million native English users, there are about 1.35 billion non-native English users. And so because of this massive disparity, um, non-native speakers of English are much more likely to be using English with other non-native English speakers, even in L1 contexts like the United States. Uh, non-native speakers will be using English in the United States, in Maryland, with other non-native English users in stores and restaurants, hospitals, call centers. So this, this disparity, this difference has led many in the TESOL profession to begin to acknowledge the reality that native speakers can't really control how English will be impacted and probably changed by non-native English speaker use. And when so many non-native English speakers are using English with other non-native speakers around the world, Many TESOL experts are now saying that we will all have to ask ourselves what we really mean by correct pronunciation. Is it correct Maryland pronunciation? Correct Maryland pronunciation? Is it United States? What part of the United States? And so on. And in fact, researchers in the field, and I think this is really interesting and important, researchers in this field that study the use of non-native English um, in uh, study the use of English by non-native speakers. Um, this area is called, um, as you may know, English as a lingua franca or um, ELF, have found that in fact, non-native speakers don't typically judge negatively um, other non-native speakers' pronunciation errors. So uh, this research comes from Jennifer Jenkins' work in 2012. So um, that's something that's really important to keep in mind. And as a result, and I'm going to read a quote by uh, Tan, Farishan, uh, Sahragard, and Faryabi in 2019, they say that native speakers in English-speaking communities, for example, the United States, the United Kingdom, 
form a small group compared with English users across the globe, and they cannot judge what is appropriate in an international context. So this kind of sets the stage for us to start to think about what we mean by correct pronunciation. And of course, even within English speakers, uh, a group of what we would call native English speakers, there are different circles. And it's interesting to explore this question of correct English pronunciation by considering catch, catch roos, <laughs> concentric circles of English. So catch talks about the inner circle being the accents that we often hear on our ESL listening texts. Um, from the United States, the United Kingdom, maybe Canada, maybe Australia. But then there are also outer circle uh, uh, English, native English speakers. Uh, these are countries um, where English is spoken as a native language. Countries like Pakistan, Nigeria, India, and Singapore. And they're typically referred to as world Englishes in much of the research. And then of course we have the expanding circle that I just referred to of English, English users, the growing body of English users from all over the world, these non-native speakers using English. So this calls into question like who actually owns English? Um, who gets to decide what is standard English? Is it only those of us who are in the inner circle? Can we also stretch to the outer circle? Um, research have argued, the researchers have argued that if we only consider users of English in the inner circle as the ones being in charge or in control of English, that that's a limited and some would say racist view. So we need to kind of think about that as we talk about pronunciation. Cameron and Galloway very succinctly remind us, English is no longer used exclusively among native English speakers or in native English speaking contexts. As such, it seems increasingly irrelevant for those learning the language to be exposed to a monolingual native model in the classroom. So, if we are not going to limit our idea of what is correct when it comes to English pronunciation, what does this mean for those of us who teach English users, English learners in a context like Maryland? What does this mean for our pronunciation instruction? And Judy Gilbert, who is one of the godmothers of pronunciation instruction in the United States, has this great quote that I just love. She says, our goal is to develop listener-friendly pronunciation. So rather than think of a pronunciation in terms of like correct or incorrect, it might be more appropriate to shoot for comprehensible or as Judy Gilbert calls it, listener-friendly pronunciation. It's a much more attainable and practical path for our students to focus on listener friendly instead of native speaker accent. Um, some researchers back in 2009, Abramson and Heiltonstam, <laughs> um, found that after the age of 12, 12 years old, it is difficult or almost impossible for most learners to develop native like pronunciation anyways. So if, if students are aiming for that, it's going to be impossible. And then again, calling back to my previous question of what is, what is native English pronunciation anyways. So m many experts suggest that it's much more valuable to focus on core pronunciation features that really make a difference. If a native English speaker, or sorry, if a non-native English speaker, say from China, is speaking with another non-native English speaker from Brazil in a store, in a restaurant, on the phone, does it really matter if they are pronouncing the er sound correctly? Well, research tells us, in fact, it doesn't. So this needs to inform our instruction. What is listener-friendly pronunciation? And rather than focusing on achieving a native accent, students should focus on producing speech that can be understood by a wide range of different listeners. And this is often referred to uh, as the intelligibility principle. Um, and that's that comes from Derwin and Monroe in 2015. 
The reason I have this picture here is I recently heard from one of the teachers in our program at the English Language Center, an anecdote which I think sums this up, this, this idea of intelligibility principle or listener-friendly pronunciation so perfectly. She was talking about um, one of her very, very high proficiency students who works at the NHS. And so this student is a researcher, extremely well-educated, um, beyond an advanced level uh, speaker. And um, the, the student, as I said, works at the NHS. And so for that student, like the gold standard, the, the most excited that they get, um, he and other international workers get really excited when their recorded presentations aren't captioned. When whatever the, the whatever PowerPoint they are voicing over, whatever presentation they're giving, when it's recorded, it isn't captioned. So that um, that means that their speech is comprehensible enough that the whoever was listening to it didn't feel the need for captions. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about listener friendly, and. Um, in uh, the most recent book that I worked on with uh, Liu and Reed, um, we say that for the overwhelming majority of learners of English, close imitation of native speech accents is not important, while being easily understood by people around the world is. So again, our goal always should be listener-friendly pronunciation, not a native accent. So that brings us to the next question, and that is what should we focus on to achieve this goal? There are so many aspects of English pronunciation. When we're in the classroom, how can we kind of focus our instruction and focus the practice? And I'm gonna suggest a couple of kind of themes that might be helpful to think about as we go into some more practical suggestions in just a few moments. The first is that we wanna take a really practical approach to teaching English pronunciation. Learning the International Phonetic Alphabet or a version of the International Phonetic Alphabet does not equate to learning pronunciation. Symbols can and probably should be used to introduce sounds, for example, because uh, the sound spelling correspondence in English is extremely weak. I mean, there's something like nine different ways to spell the I sound. So uh, it, it can be very efficient and helpful to use uh, pronunciation symbols like the International Phonetic Alphabet to introduce the sounds. Also, um, because for the reason that, sorry, because um, one symbol represents one sound. And so instead of trying to juggle a lot of different pronunciations, you can just have a simple symbol to represent that sound. It can also be helpful to use the IPA symbols to distinguish between tricky sounds. So for example, some Chinese learners of English find it really challenging to discriminate, to tell the difference between s and these sounds to them sound exactly the same. Um, and so using two different symbols to show the difference between two different sounds can be really helpful because then the students understand, oh, we're talking about two different sounds here, even though they can't necessarily hear those sounds. And also using international phonetic symbols of the international phonetic alphabet can kind of give students like a visual image to hang their new sounds on wherever they're learning them. It can kind of give them an anchor or a, a touchstone for those sounds. So the IPA can certainly be useful, but I am not personally a huge fan of transcription activities in the pronunciation classroom. I'm currently teaching a pronunciation class for advanced learners, and we do one or two throughout the semester. Um, but there is not a lot of evidence to indicate that, that learning the IPA leads to more comprehensible pronunciation. So I'll use it for pedagogical reasons, but I don't I don't necessarily uh, spend a lot of time doing a lot of transcription activities or or teaching the IPA. Instead, I'm much more interested in that listener friendly pronunciation I was talking about. Okay, as well, it's important to think about balanced instruction too. And so in pronunciation research and in and in pronunciation, 
pedagogical materials, it's often divided between segmentals and suprasegmentals. Segmentals are the individual sounds, the consonant sounds like j, r, v, and the vowel sounds like i, a, a. Uh. Suprasegmentals, on the other hand, are the more um, the pronunciation features associated with words and longer pieces of speech. We're talking here about speech rhythm, things like how many syllables a word has. For example, the word chocolate in English has two syllables that to always blows my students' minds because they want to pronounce it with three or four syllables. Um, speech rhythm also includes word stress. So I have a um, I have an anecdote I share with my students about um, one of my students many years ago going up to um, New York, and he was on a train, and he was um, trying to find the the correct uh, stop for Manhattan. He was asking the people on the train, New Yorkers, where is Manhattan? What stop is Manhattan? And they couldn't understand him. They're like, is that a restaurant? Is that a shop? What are you looking for? Well, of course, they, he was looking for Manhattan, but he was stressing the word incorrectly. And so that was extremely difficult for the people on the train to understand. So in terms of speech rhythm, we're talking about syllables, we're talking about word stress, and also speech rhythm includes sentence stress. So that same idea that we have some stressed syllables in a word and some reduced syllables in a multisyllabic word, we apply that to our speech as well. We have some words we say very clearly and some words we also reduce. We don't speak English like this. In fact, we reduce some words, some words almost disappear and some words we say quite clearly. So that is the speech rhythm, the irregular speech rhythm of English. It's quite different in other cultures, other languages. They pronounce, if it's there, they pronounce it. So this study of supersegmentals can be quite challenging for our students. As well, in terms of supersegmentals, we're talking about prosody. And this is the music of our voices. And I, I like to tell students, and I, I pulled this anecdote from somewhere, um, this analogy from somewhere, um, I probably uh, Brinton, uh, Sels Mercia Brinton and Goodwin, which is often referred to as the pronunciation Bible, um, that if you're in a crowded place, like a crowded airport, you can often hear someone speaking your language from a long way away, even if you can't, can't actually hear the words that they're saying. Um, that's the prosody. The music of their voice is carrying that language to you, even if you can't hear the, the words. You can still identify that it's it's English or it's uh, your native language. So um, when we talk about prosody, we talk about things like focus or prominence. A great example comes from Marnie Reed's work on int implicational intonation. Uh, she has this great example of saying to the students, the teacher didn't grade your papers. The teacher didn't grade the papers. And by having that, that pitch change on the word teacher, the teacher didn't grade the papers. Proficient English users can hear that pitch change and know that in fact, somebody did grade the papers. It just wasn't the teacher. They can understand that. But I've often asked many of my sometimes very advanced level learners, um, did were the papers graded? And they'll often say no, because they aren't hearing that pitch change. Or if they do hear it, they believe it's just decorative. It doesn't actually have a meaning. And in English, that pitch change carries all the meaning. Um, so that's what I'm talking about when, when we talk about focus or prominence, that pitch change um, in our speech that often carries important meaning. And also in terms of prosody, I'm talking about intonation. Um, the pitch change, whether it goes up and down, whether it goes up can imply a different meaning. Think about the difference between these two, exactly the same words said differently. Ready? Ready. Ready is a question. Ready is a statement. So uh, when I talk about prosody, of course, we're talking about that kind of pitch change carrying meaning as well. And finally, in terms of supersegmentals, we talk about connected speech. 
in English, when you when you see English written, you can see where one word ends and the next word begins. Um, we run all our words together when we speak. We run all our words together. Um, and so students have a really hard time often hearing those, the separation between one where one word ends and the next word begins. It can, it, sometimes we cut sounds out. Sometimes we change sounds or add new sounds in when we're doing this connected speech. Um, so when I talk about balanced instruction, we want to make sure that we are not just teaching those consonant and vowel sounds to our students, but we're also incorporating all of these supra segmental elements. Sels Mercia, Brinton, and Goodwin in their Bible of English pronunciation, and I'll share some of my favorite resources with you at the end. They say that while segmental instruction may still be important, so those consonant and vowel sounds, they're important for accent reduction in the long run, it is essential to give priority to prosody in pronunciation since it results in better comprehensibility in the short run. So we wanna give a little more attention to the super segmentals. So this kind of leads into the concept of high value targets. When we talk about um, segmentals and consonant sounds, we want to think about the sounds that are the most important for our students to learn. And those are the ones uh, that can change the meaning of the words. So not our students don't need to learn all of the sounds in English necessarily. What they need to learn is the the word, the sounds that change the meaning of words. This is referred to in pronunciation instruction as functional load. What this means is uh, students need to learn the sounds that appear often in English words and appear often in natural speech and they are similar to other sounds. So students may not need to learn the contrast between th and th because there are very, very few words which are only dis distinguished by th or th. Students may need to learn more words that contain sounds like er and ul because there are there are more words sorry students may need to learn er and ul because there are more words that are distinguished by those sounds and so if you're interested in this there's a really nice list this comes from uh Cels Mercia, Brinton and Goodwin of relative functional load for consonant sounds so, um, and they divide that by initial consonant sounds and fi uh, final consonant sounds, and then of course, vowel contrasts as well. And so the higher the functional load, the more important those contrasts are for students to master. And of course, you can see, for example, here at number two, p, b, is, as an initial consonant has a 98% relative functional load. So that means it's really important for students to be able to distinguish between p and b and to pronounce p and b accurately at the beginning of their words. A huge problem for our Arabic speakers for whom p and b are exactly the same, many of them. Uh, so they will want to work on those sounds. So if you have students that have trouble distinguishing be between some of these kind of more high value targets, those are the ones that you'll want to work on with your students. And as I said, this list comes from Cels Mercia, Brenton, and Goodwin. But you probably can find, um, you know, there. This is this is not uh, this is not their research. This is uh, you can find this on the internet as well if you Google it. And in terms of high value targets for uh, supra segmentals, the research shows us again and again that word stress and focus are the most important aspects of English pronunciation in terms of supra segmentals. That doesn't mean we ignore everything else, but if we're really gonna focus on high value targets, if we only have a little time with our students, we wanna hammer home word stress and focus as much as possible. Um, and this is all summed up in Okim Kang's research from 2013. She found that um, she did some research related to high stakes speaking tests. So she looked at TOEFL responses, IELTS responses, TOEIC responses, 
and looked at 120 speech files and um, determined comprehensibility of different pronunciation features. And she found, and I quote here, a clear hierarchical structure in the importance of pronunciation features. And this just all points towards word stress and focus. So again, when I talk about word stress and focus, syllables is part of that. We know that some students pronounce every syllable because it's there. Um, I have students from South America, Central America, uh, who say chocolate instead of chocolate. And we know that when students add extra syllables to their speech, it's extremely hard to understand. We also have students that cut syllables from English words. Uh, when I was in China a few years ago, I had a tour guide who told a lot of different anecdotes. And uh, one of them was he wanted to tell a story about a syntist. And I'm pretty good at understanding different accents, but I was thinking like, what is he talking about? What is a syntist? And of course, what he was referring to was a scientist, but he was saying syntist instead. He had cut out one of the syllables. It made it very, very hard to understand what he was referring to. It took several, several minutes, actually, before I understood. And I had to listen to much of the anecdote before I knew what he was talking about. We also have students who, um, in their first languages, do not have a lot of consonant clusters. And so uh, that's two consonants that appear close together in the word. So they often want to insert a vowel sound and they're, therefore insert a syllable in between two consonant clusters that they struggle to pronounce correctly. So um, here I'm using the word correctly, of course, a little bit loosely. Um, but we'll hear students say things like, can I get a sipoon? And instead of spoon, uh, sipoon, and they're adding a syllable. And that, again, makes it really hard for us to understand. As I said previously, word stress is extremely important when it comes to um, stressing the correct syllable and pronouncing the vowel sound of that correct syllable um, accurately, comprehensibly. So um, here, I, this is an anecdote I share with my students as well. I was uh, in Malaysia a few years ago and I was getting ready to climb um, Mount Kinabalu there. And we had to have special passes, cards that the um, guides were going to give us in order to get up the mountain. And uh, the guide came out and said, well, we're waiting for the cards. We can't go yet. The mission isn't working. I was like, mission? What is he talking about? The mission isn't working. Well, of course, he meant machine, not mission. And so just by misstressing that, by stressing um, the wrong syllable, it was very, very difficult to understand him. And then finally, uh, when we talk about focus or prominence, here's another example. Um, another extremely important high value target, the teacher is saying to the student, and this quote comes directly from Marnie Reed's research again, um, the teacher is saying to the student, well, you can turn your paper in late, you can turn in your paper late. Well, proficient users of English will recognize that the teacher doesn't really want him to turn the paper in late. He can, but she would prefer he didn't. And the student may only be hearing the affirmative words and not the meaning that is implied in the intonation pattern, you can turn in your paper late and goes away thinking that it's not going to be a problem. Oh, great. Thank you. And so this is actually an extremely dangerous pronunciation misunderstanding because the student, um, both both speakers feel that they have understood what's happened in, in, this, in this interaction. And in fact, of course, they haven't. So that can be a problem. So Judy Gilbert uh, tells us that English pronunciation does not amount to a mastery of a list of sounds or isolated words. Instead, it amounts to learning and practicing the specifically English way of making speakers thoughts easy to follow. Going back to that listener friendly pronunciation. Okay, so maybe you're sitting there thinking, great, I'm sold. How can I teach high value targets in my classroom? And this is where we get into something a little more practical for us. And in order to talk about pronunciation instruction, Celso Mercia, Brenton, and Goodwin take us through uh, what they call their communicative framework 
uh, for pronunciation instruction. Um, and of course, this is th this is relating all to pronunciation, but of course, this framework works well with almost any kind of English instruction. And the great news is that Cooper found in 2006 that intervention works for our students. If we can get in and follow this communicative framework, we can actually make a really big difference if we're focusing on some of those high value targets, those consonant and vowel sounds that students absolutely need and we are focusing on stress and prominence or focus, as well as all the other stuff as we have time. So the first step is the description of the target. And I'm suggesting a few tools here. Yeah, I'm not, not sure why they're coming up at different intervals, but um, there we go. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna suggest a few different tools here uh, for when you want to describe what students need to do. And uh, I work with also low proficiency students and they just don't have the English for a lot of like that kind of, um, you know, descriptive language of what's happening inside the speech pathway. So I need to use as many visuals as possible. Uh, sagittal diagrams are great. We can find them on the internet. There's also a great book I'll share a little bit later um, that has a lot of these great pictures. So students can actually see the difference inside their mouths of what should be happening when they are aiming for pronouncing different sounds. You know, they can see that the difference between s and sh is where their tongue is inside their mouth. Also, down here in the corner, you can see a video. I love Rachel's English. Uh, she has a lot of great videos and she kind of does this little drawing so students can see what is ha what's happening inside the mouth. Um, that's extremely helpful for them. I also love the color vowel chart. And in fact, um, I give out little mini color vowel charts to all my students. I buy them from the color vowel chart folks. Um, I buy a package of, I don't know, like 100 at a time or something. And um, I really like the color vowel chart because it bypasses the need for my students to learn the phonetic symbols. And it also assigns a color to every single English vowel sound. So um, it's it's kind of a, an easier touchstone for them instead of learning the IPA symbols that are for vowels, um, new, unfamiliar. Um, and to be honest, I struggled for years to learn the uh, phonetic alphabet when it came to vowel sounds. So I really love the color vowel chart. So instead of saying, you know, it's it's A, I just say it's gray. It's not red, it's gray. And the students are familiar with what that means. Um, as well, a few other fun tools for introducing different um, sounds. Uh, the red sock, I love. This comes from Sue Miller's work. If you have to show students what they should be doing with their tongue, you can put on a red sock. And it's just kind of, it's fun. And it kind of helps focus students' attention on what their tongue should be doing. As well, you can see I have a couple of different lollipops uh, on the screen. The big... Uh, Tootsie Pops are great for sounds that uh, students have to stick their tongues out of their mouths for, uh, especially the th and th sounds. So just students hold up the lollipop close to their mouth and th and th and it encourages them to stick their tongues out. Uh, many of our students come from cultures where that is extremely rude and they are very uncomfortable doing it. So if they have a little barrier and uh, you know some sweet candy to taste, that can be nice too. The flatter kind of lollipops, um, and I order all this stuff off Amazon, the flatter lollipops can be really good to show tongue height when it comes to uh, vowel sounds. Vowel sounds are tough for students because everything happens inside the mouth. So if you have the lollipop and students can see sometimes the, the contrast between how high their tongue needs to be for sounds like E versus I, that contrast between E, a green, and I, silver, can be super challenging for them. So E, I, E, I, I, E, I. You can see, hopefully, the stick moving up and down. And that just, I give students a lollipops and they can kind of play around with them and see what's happening inside their own mouths. Now, I dropped my, um, I use coffee stir sticks, but you can use chopsticks or even just have the students use their own pens or pencils, although it's a bit gross. 
Um, and I use this a lot for the er sound because students have a really hard time kind of curling their tongue under. They want to bring it up and often touch their tooth ridge or the roof of their mouth. So having them bite down on that, that uh, stir stick or a chopstick like this and saying er, their tongue should curl under. If their tongue is touching the stick, then they're not pronouncing the sound correctly. They're not moving their tongue in the correct way. I'm using feathers. Um, I, again, I bought these off Amazon to practice the sounds, the aspirated sounds, like the difference between p and b, p, b, p, b. The feather should move a lot for the aspirated sounds and not very much for the unaspirated sounds. Um, and finally, the tape. Sometimes students have a little trouble getting their upper lip up and out of the way for sounds like f and v. Um, they will often, um, I have a, a lot of Korean speakers uh, I'm thinking of specifically right now that will often say, um, f, f, and they want to keep their lip down. So, so when they say something like cough, coffee, it sounds like coffee, coffee, because they're not able to move their lip up and out of the way. So just giving them a little bit of tape can be fun um, and having them tape up their, their lip to their nose a little bit like this. I'm really glad this is being recorded, by the way. Having them tape <laughs> their uh, lip up to their nose and practice getting it out of the way. It's a little hard to do that um, with my dry tape. But anyways, this can, th just using tools like this can be a lot of fun, but it can also really help students to get a feel for what's happening inside their mouths. After we've done the description of target, it's really important to do a listening discrimination activity. Um, I like to use things like the fly swatters or um, having students identify the uh, stress patterns by listening to words. And then uh, I might have stress patterns on the board and give students um, post-it notes where they have to run up and put the stress pattern, uh, the word according to the correct stress pattern. So for example, trumpet, tuba, cello, Violin? No, violin does not belong there. So kind of doing some kind of listening discrimination activity, maybe they're moving cards or, um, you know, uh, writing words under certain stress patterns can be helpful. As well, the good old one, did they hear er or did they hear, hear ul as I'm reading a list of words to kind of discriminate between sounds that they're having trouble listening to? And as well, um, doing, oh, sorry, having students uh, do any kind of dictation, writing down what they hear, writing down if they've heard things that are the same or different. So I might say, write, write. And for number one, students would write S. I might say, write, light or row, low uh, for number two. And students would write different. Or I might have stress patterns, word stress or syllable counts. Do, do students hear the same number of syllables, how many syllables are they hearing? They can just write those things down. Great listening discrimination. Then moving into controlled practice. And I like to think of controlled practice in two kind of different ways, but they're both very, very important. Uh, the first is choral repetition. And uh, I have never, I've observed hundreds and hundreds of teachers. I have never walked away from a lesson thinking, wow, that was too much choral repetition. Um, I'm currently learning Korean right now. And um, I, I, I don't get enough repetition. I have to ask my teacher all the time. I need to repeat that again and again. Students really need that practice. And in fact, there's a nice quote from Oli Kellen. Uh, he says, the robustness of long-term memories is directly related to the number of repetitions. An illustrative analogy is walking on a lawn. Tracks will arise where you walk sufficiently many times, nowhere else. And faint tracks may easily become grassed again unless, unless re-walked on at times. So we need a lot of repetition when we're learning new pronunciations. Tools can help out the lollipops and all that. When I'm doing choral repetition, I have my students using their tools. Another great tool for word stress is the rubber band. This is Judy Gilbert tool. The thicker, the better, and have students pull that rubber band as they're saying the stressed syllable. Uh, Manhattan, machine, having them pull that, that rubber band. 
gestures, Manhattan, machine, open, open palm for the stressed syllable, closed palm for the unstressed syllable, conducting for focus. The teacher didn't grade the papers. The teacher didn't grade the papers. And as I am saying these, my students are repeating and they are doing these gestures. They are repeating these gestures after me. Um, and body movements, having students raise their eyebrows or lower their eyebrows. So a machine, machine, or standing up, machine. All of these movements, we know from research that um, what students do with their bodies, they remember with their brains. And covert rehearsal is very important as well. This idea comes from Wayne Dickerson's work in 2016. He talks about covert rehearsal as um, we would maybe just call this practice or private practice. Um, he says that covert rehearsal has to be thoughtful. It can't just be um, students saying the same, same sounds again and again without thinking about their mouth position, just kind of going through the motions. It has to be thoughtful. And he, they have found, researchers under Wayne Dickerson have found that uh, covert rehearsal leads to long-term pronunciation gains. Students might be able to pronounce something correctly with you or in your classroom, uh, but then they need that covert rehearsal to take it, to take that new pronunciation feature well past your class. So we do this in several ways, maybe by recordings, having students do recordings, listen to their own recordings, evaluate their recordings. Um, I also listen to my students' recordings uh, every, every week, several times a week. I also do model recordings for my students if they ask for it. Uh, they may have trouble with certain words and certain sounds, uh, certain phrases that they want to be able to pronounce accurately. So I, I'll just have them hold their cell phone, bring their cell phone in or hold their cell phone up to the computer and I'll say the words for them. And then they've got the, that recording on their phone. And as they go through their lives, maybe as they're driving or washing dishes or whatever, they can practice that phrase or that word again and again, because they have that model. The idea is that they listen to the model, they practice and they think thoughtfully about their pronunciation. And my favorite tool um, for English learning in general is the humble post-it note. If students are struggling with a sound, uh, when I was back in the classroom in person, I would just slap a post-it note right down on their desk and say, write two or three words with this sound, post it up on your bathroom mirror, put it on your driving, st your steering wheel in your car, put it above your kitchen sink, wherever you are spending time and practice, practice, practice those sounds, those words, those phrases, thoughtfully, not just repeating again and again, um, but that covert rehearsal can really lead to long-term pronunciation gains. Then moving into guided practice, and there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, some are uh, all challenging for students, um, some a little bit more interactive or more fun than others. Uh, but dictations are a really important way for students to work on their listening discrimination. Um, also, um, really help students with those, the connected speech phenomenon. I know it's not a high value pronunciation target, but it's still something students really struggle with. So dictations can be helpful. Um, doing mazes of some sort where students have to uh, discriminate between two different sounds and they have to work their way through the maze just finding words that contain that sound or that stress pattern or that number of syllables. Uh, a great resource I'll share with you at the end is uh, pronunciation games that 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 resource contains some photocopyable mazes there. Um, as well, having students do lineups. I love um, having students maybe line up in terms of syllable count. So I might give, if I have a large class, I might break students up into three or four different groups, um, give each student a card and have them line up according to uh, the one syllable word all the way through to the six syllable word. And they have to figure out how many syllables their word has and then line up within their group. Uh, as well, silent minimal pairs, um, minimal pairs or silent minimal pairs. I do with my students, I might give them a list of words that are the same except for one sound. So the, um, the row low example might be one or the, um, the pig 
big example. The, the words are exactly the same except for one sound. That, that's what a minimal pair is. And so students can practice. Uh, one student will say, the students are both looking at the same list of words, the same list of minimal pairs. And one student will say, pig. And the other student points at the P-I-G word. And then the next one, the student might say, Bob. And the student will, the listening student will point at the B-O-B word, not the P-O-P word. Um, but as well, if students are struggling with getting their mouth in the correct position for some of the minimal pairs, uh, for example, the difference between er and ul, you can see that a little bit on my face. Er tends to be a little bit more rounded and ul might be a little bit flatter. Um, you can have students do silent minimal pairs. This works really well with the e i difference or a uh, ah, where there's a big visible difference between um, how my face looks for one vowel sound and how it looks for the other vowel sound. And so students will work in pairs and they'll have, again, the same list of words. And one of them will say, and instead of cut, they will know that it's caught and they can see it. It's very, very effective for students. It helps them to really exaggerate those motions what they do big in the classroom, they'll do small outside of the classroom, so it's great practice. Having students do card matches can also be extremely uh, useful, just having them stand up, walk around the room, and find the person with their uh, match. It could be a word stress pattern to a word, a syllable count to a word, um, a, a sentence stress pattern to a sentence, that kind of thing, and then they can be in partners for the rest of the lesson. And also, um, which one did you hear? So that goes back to the one to practice, but they can do it as partners. Moving on to more communicative practice. This gets a little harder because students sometimes with communicative practice, they forget the pronunciation feature that they should be working on and because they get so engrossed in the actual communicative activity that they're doing. But having targeted conversation questions, uh, for example, if you're working on a particular word stress pattern, maybe the difference between how um, words like present and present are pronounced when it's the noun versus the verb, there's a shift in stress. If you're working on that with students, you might create some conversation questions where they have to ask and answer questions using some of those words having them do skits where they have to use particular target sounds or target voc vocabulary containing those sounds. Um, conversation problem solving. Again, um, I, I'm going to be working on uh, the final S, the pronunciation of the final S with some of my students next week. And I'm going to have them do an activity where they get little pieces of information about different people and they have to fill in a grid. They have to work together and fill in a grid. It's a conversation activity, but their focus will be pronouncing that S ending. And if they're not focused on that, if they start to forget, then I've taken an idea from one of my colleagues at the English Language Center. Um, he often travels around his conversation classes with like a little squeaker or a little animal, a uh, little toy that makes a little noise. And when he hears students mispronouncing something, or in his case, often using incorrect grammar, um, he squeaks it. And it's just like a little, um, little auditory cue, like, oh, I've made a mistake. Okay, what did I just say? And students can give students the opportunity to go back and self-correct, which we know is a more effective use of uh, error correction when they are self-correcting. It's more likely to lead to uptake of that correction. So I just want to kind of end, and we'll have a little time for questions here, with this quote from um, somebody who I always refer to as my T-cell crush, Keith Fulce. He says, when people, including our learners, refer to second language ability, their primary goal seems to be speaking. Almost all of my ESL, EFL students dream of the day when they can finally say, I speak English well. And part of speaking English well, an important part, maybe an essential part of speaking English well relates back to comprehensible or learner-friendly pronunciation. 
Now, as promised, I, I said I would share some of my favorite pronunciation resources. Uh, this is um, the, the Bible, the teaching pronunciation at Self's Mercy of Brenton and Goodwin. It's a big, chunky book, um, but it, if you are interested in teaching pronunciation, it's really the, the go-to. Um, I also refer to pronunciation games. Uh, this has got some nice photocopyable materials, and I use um, Melody Knowles American Accent Skills often um, to teach uh, all the a lot of these ideas, the feathers and the, the stir sticks and the lollipops and stuff come from her books. And uh, the sagittal diagrams, uh, I've gotten many of them from pronunciation contrast in English. And finally, if you're interested in prosody and you don't know much about it, a very um, accessible, user-friendly and free uh, guide if you Google teaching pronunciation using the prosody pyramid, that's free for you online. And it's, um, it's not a challenging read, it's really quite easy and it really gives a nice overview of uh, teaching prosody. So that is it for me I might leave up um, maybe I'll leave up the uh, my favorite resources and then Chris were yeah. there any questions yeah actually there's been a pretty lively chat going on um, as you've been
Everybody, I'm going to go ahead and share the survey link now. So that way, if you want to click it and open it, um, we'll still also have a couple more resources from Tamara. And then I want to show a couple of other things just before we finish. But I wanted you guys to have the feedback survey there now. Um, so let's jump into some questions. <clears throat> so very early on in your session, um, one of our LCMC instructors asked, in the classroom, a lot of times students express that they want to work on their pronunciation and are even sometimes apologetic about their accents. Often, too, the reason they bring um, they bring this up is because of experiences where native speakers didn't understand them or showed signs of frustration or anger. So how do we support students in improving their listener-friendly pronunciation without reinforcing negative feelings and experiences that they might have? Oh, my gosh, that's such a good question. Um, and, you know, it's something that, in fact, I just ran into um, at the beginning of the semester with my pronunciation students. Um, so, and I tell them, sometimes it is not your pronunciation. Sometimes it is um, the inability or the unwillingness of the native speaker listener to to understand um so yeah uh, i i don't have a great answer i don't i think students i mean i i think that we do it through gentle correction through giving them the best feedback that we can um and and spending time giving them feedback you know when we when we assess students writing we spend time reading their writing and providing helpful corrective feedback and also praise when it's when it's appropriate i mean you know or always i try to always praise my students um but you know that's that's what i can can do for them. They know what they're struggling with. They know the reality that they face. So if I can give them really good, thoughtful, helpful feedback, um, and that's that's the best thing that I can do for them, I think. Makes sense. Gotcha. Okay. So one of the questions was, uh, do you have a list of resources, which you've already shared there? Um, Let's see, is there a list of resources of functional load sounds that are specific to specific languages? So specific to Spanish, specific to uh, Spanish speakers, Chinese speakers, et cetera? Yes. So this book, Pronunciation Contrast in English, is an old, old, oldie. And it, as a result, it's super, super cheap on Amazon. It's like 10 bucks or something. Um, but that has a list of by um, minimal pair, which um, language really, which languages will struggle with that? Maybe. There's a lot of kind of research and maybe a new, a newer way of thinking that we can't just say, oh, you're a Korean speaker, so you are going to have problems with this sound. Uh, we can't do that. We really do have to listen to our students and, and identify them as individuals, what they're going to struggle with. Uh, but having said that, there are some generalizations or at least a starting point and pronunciation contrast in English offers that as does learner English by, so yes, oh, right, Swain, is it Swain and Smith? Smith and oh, Swain? Blurry. Yeah, so there was a, actually a couple comments in the chat about this. So learner English by Michael Swan, uh, S-W-A-N, and uh, Bernard Smith. Um, and, and that's a, a phenomenal book. Maybe it'll show up this time. No, of course not. Um <laughs> But that's, I know a couple of people in this session have actually used that book. Some have borrowed my copy of it from back when I was at ELC. Um, and it's, it does exactly what we're talking about. It breaks it down by a lot of, I guess, not dialects, but different regions of, of first languages. And it's really fantastic. It also talks about um, not just pronunciation, but about writing tendencies, about spelling tendencies, about vocabulary things. It's super, super helpful. So yeah, that's a really an awesome suggestion. All right. And then I had a bunch of people asking about the color vowel chart. So I think um, I, I, I didn't see necessarily like a picture of anything other than like your actual physical ones there. Yeah. Uh, do you just top that type that in Google color vowel chart and go from there? Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it, she she makes her living off of this. She's Karen Taylor is amazing. Um, she makes her living off of this. So um, when I, you know, I try not to just you know, do a screenshot of the color vowel chart. I do try to spend a little bit of money there. Um, her stuff is not expensive, but it's, uh, yeah, um, somebody's just noticed there's a whole website for the color vowel chart. So just type it in. Tons of great resources, books. There's an app called Blue Canoe. It's wonderful. Is that Karen Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, I just tossed her name in the, in the chat just in case. Okay. So we had some, let's see, let me find where we were. All right. Okay. So um, 
Loreen says, my son-in-law is from India and he repeatedly uses the long A sound in many words. For example, he says Sayed um, for the word said. He assumes the word uh, said sounds like say, right? Um, and I haven't corrected him out of respect. Am I wrong? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I would say that uh, if he is saying say yet, um, what the probably the bigger problem um, in terms of comprehensibility is um, that uh, he's adding a syllable. He's pronouncing two vowel sounds there, and that's causing a, probably a bigger problem. Um, I would say if you are going to offer any, I mean, son-in-law, it's tough. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to offer any feedback, I'm not going to get into the family dynamics there. Uh, you could judge that yourself, but if you're going to offer any feedback, I would offer it as, um, you know, are you being, are you, do people misunderstand you? Here's here, here might be why here is what we do. Here's what I'm hearing from you. Um, you know, if, if Marylanders are having a hard time understanding you, you might try limiting to one syllable. You might try um, instead of a, maybe a, a lowering your tongue, like doing, giving some very practical advice might be helpful. Um, it's tough when it's a son-in-law and not a student. Students are in our class because they know they have problems. Son-in-laws, yeah, you can decide that. <laughs> so kind of along those same lines, uh, kind of sticking with like uh, specific instances of a, of a, an English learner. Um, question says, is there a way to get Korean speakers to stop adding S um, after, after uh, there's a question mark here, maybe a particular phoneme. Are there rules for saying ED as two syllables or, or one? Um, this, maybe this is too, hold on, let me reframe this question. It looks like there's two questions here. Is there a way to have Korean speakers stop adding S after maybe words? Is that something that you've run into? No, I students, Korean speakers will sometimes add the uh sound at the end because in Korean, very few words end with a consonant sound. Uh, so in very few syllables end with a consonant sound. So for example, for uh, a word like church, uh, they want to say churchy or churche. They want to add that uh, syllable. And so we, I, I frame that as a syllable problem, not as a sound problem. And that seems to help, you know, counting and just having them instead of saying church, saying church. So same with my Spanish speakers at the beginning, a school. And instead of a school, we go school, you know, just so just drawing their attention, doing a lot, a lot, a lot of practice. Mm. Um, they just need that muscle memory. They need they need that choral repetition. I think that your answer is kind of uh, answers that kind of second part of this person's question was, you know, are there rules for ED endings? Um, and, you know, how do we teach that to different language speakers, right? And I, I know the answer obviously is factually, yes, of course, there are rules, and it takes a long time for them. But um, I guess, can you kind of summarize a little bit what maybe like your, your top favorite activity or your favorite type of teaching for that would be if you're looking at the EDs? Endings. Um, well, the biggest thing, there are rules, but um, for my, for most of our learners, the biggest difference is the syllable. Uh, when a word ends in a t or d sound, we add a syllable like wa um, wanted, but when it ends in any other sound, we don't add a syllable. So differentiating between like the t ending for walked and the d ending for um, uh, I'm uh, totally blank. What do you need? What an example? I need a word that ends in a voiced consonant sound. Um, uh, that's not a D or a T. Yeah. Um, read no read no. It's no. Not, uh, irregular. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's literally three o'clock in the morning for me right now, so I am totally blanking. But um, okay, so anyways, there are rules differentiating between the T and D for ED pronunciation, I think is, is something Grab. we teach in pronunciation class, but it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, what you want to focus on is adding that syllable, clapping, I mean, or tapping or any of that stuff, any of those body movements will be really, really helpful. Cool. And then if, and someone in the chat said grab, for example, grab. Oh, grab, yeah, yeah, grabbed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Someone so, for whom it is 12 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Let's do one more question, then a, just kind of a, a last uh, couple of final finishing up details. Um, and this question was kind of asked in a couple of different ways, um, but I, I think it's a really kind of a, an important one. Differences between doing it in person versus doing it online. So right now, 
um, as Chris said, uh, for some of you, you may have heard as you were coming in, I'm living in Korea right now, uh, and I'm teaching at the English Language Center. So all of my students are in the United States, and I'm here, and I teach on Zoom. And you're right, it can be hard. I think the more that you do, um, uh, you do that practice with them, that choral repetition, I've actually gotten pretty good at hearing my students, even when they're repeating all together. But the biggest thing that's helped me are the gestures, because then I can get them all synchronous. So I will say to them, if we're practicing, I don't know, like an ED ending, for example, I will say like, walk, walked, grade, graded, and so I'm doing it silently as a model for them and that gets them more synchronous. So it's a little bit easier. Um, we can't ask, we can't make students turn their cameras on, but I ask them to, that helps. Um, and you know, it's, it can be hard to see, but um, I can see, I can see Chris's mouth. Okay. I think you can probably see my mouth. Okay. If I have trouble seeing students' mouths, I ask them to get closer to the camera, turn the lights on, you know, whatever I need to do. Um, in order to be able to see them and offer the best feedback. But that anything with gestures can kind of really help reinforce for them. And it also kind of helps keep everyone on the same page. Yeah, nice. Thanks. So I think because of time, I know there were some other questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to be sharing something about HCC's event coming up and your email address is there. So it's possible people might say, I just have this dire question that I need answered from the pronunciation expert. So if I didn't get to answer everybody's question, you will see Tamara's email address on a, on a flyer in a second. So I think feel free to reach out there. I'm going to share the feedback survey again. Just as we finish up, I want to share a couple pieces of information. Um, let's see here. You should be looking at the Super Saturday flyer. So again, Tamara comes from um, Howard Community College English Language Center. They are, if you enjoyed her presentation, the PD over there is fantastic. Um, this is a once a year event called Super Saturday. It happens obviously on a Saturday. It's coming up at the end of this month on February 25th. Um, 1 through 5 p.m. It's a mini conference. I, it's a Zoom webinar, so you can do it in this same format. Um, we always try to suggest this event. It's it's three different chunks. There's a, a an invited guest speaker, Betsy Parrish, who will be the first to speak. Um, very famous in the field. Lots of books that she's written. Um, and then there is a staff presenter, Rosie Verratti, also very prominent in the field. She's going to be talking about vowels, kind of probably semi-related to what we've talked about today. Um, and then there is a teacher tips mini conference at the last last chunk of the event. A really cool way to have teachers kind of share things that they feel are very important. So again, you can see email address there is Tamara Jones, tjones at howardcc.edu. If you're interested in attending, feel free to reach out with questions. I also want to put a plug in for LCMC's next virtual brown bag, um, kind of a totally different direction this time. We kind of alternate the, the focuses of our sessions. And in this one, we're going to be talking about um, barriers to instruction. You know, they're not only content based or um, or skill based. Often there are other parts of our students that are affecting how they come to class. And in this session, we're going to talk about trauma-informed instruction. That will be on March 10th, 2023, same time, same format. Um, just like you got information about this session, you'll get it in the same way. If it's an email from your instructional specialist, if you're labor-funded, if it came just from some, one of our LCMC staff, you'll get that in the same way. Now, I um, want to thank everybody again for coming and joining us. Um, you have the feedback survey, feel free to let us know how you thought, uh, how you felt about the session. We really take your feedback um, as a really great way to help us improve our sessions. And I know Tamara appreciates kind of feedback for her presenting as well. So thank you all so much for coming um, and have a great day and we'll hope to see you next time.